Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladicast, episode 56. I'm Steve Cheetah. I'm John Cage. And I'm Andy Lewis. What the earth was that? I was trying to hurrah, because we're back again for more board gaming fun and games. It sounded like some kind of ridiculously pathetic lion. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> the campest king of the jungle I've ever heard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's as good as an intro as anything. Why not? <laughs> Have you got all your wind out now, Tudor? Oh, yeah, sorry. Don't ask a bit of windy pop, so if I do burp during the middle of the podcast, I apologise in advance. <laughs> Professional as ever. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I've just I've just wolfed down a chicken Kiev and some baked beans. You know, cornerstone of any nutritious diet. That, <laughs> <laughs> and not any old Bernard Matthews nonsense. I went full mushroom pizza tonight. No cows, so I can eat whatever the hell I like. Oh. she doesn't like mushrooms, so I'm sure as hell going to eat them when she's not here. <laughs> she's she's right though, mate. They are disgusting little things. No, no, they're delicious. No, I, I, I'm, for once, I'm going to have to agree with Mister Lewis here. See. I am right. I usually am. Oh, they no. are vile little bastards, and they should be made illegal. When I'm in charge, seriously, they're going to be outlawed. <laughs> when? God, I hope that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> Shit'll go well when I'm in charge. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can just just like cut now to this. You know, twenty years in the future, it's night. There's helicopters circling round, yeah. big billboards. <laughs> Obey the leader. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the way forward, man. People are stupid and need to be told what to do. Oh dear. And I will be happy to do it. I, I consider it a public service, actually. Well, on that bombshell, perhaps we should instruct our dear listeners on what they should and should not be playing. I like the attitude, Mr Cage. Do it. Proceed, <laughs> yes. Lieutenant. Let us proceed with the news. So, I have released the news ferrets, and some of them came back, and they came back... <laughs> <laughs> so when they were eaten bounty. by badgers. Well, I don't know what happened to the other ones. There's always... Um... Many news ferrets died to bring us this information. <laughs> <laughs> always a certain amount of uh, natural wastage in the news ferret. Uh, <laughs> that's why I keep breeding them so, so often, you see. <laughs> You've got to keep the population going. I'm glad you said right, breeding Steve. them and not breeding with them. That would have been very wrong. <laughs> Look, let's not get into the mechanisms. Let's, <laughs> let's get definitely on. not, no. <laughs> let's get on with the news instead. <laughs> to start with, I thought we might delve into some of the upcoming conventions. So we are all off to City of Kings and Aircon in the not-too-distant future. So did I say City of Kings? City of Games. Mm. No, I get that right. I think I'm right in saying that City of Kings... No, Games. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going well, boys. Solid start. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm right in saying City... It's because I've written it down wrong. City of Games. There we go. It says uh, City of Games on the screen, John, honestly. Is is sold out. If you're coming along to that, we look forward to seeing you there. I think Aircon may still have some tickets left. Really? So, I believe so, yes. If you Ooh. haven't already bought them, there's still time to join us for some shenanigans. I still have to book my hotel for that. Crap. Well, I'm going to be sleeping in the middle of Cabot Circus. Can sleep at the bottom of our bed like a like a dog. Oof. <laughs> you are the top. Uh, sorry, the top game dog. <laughs> <laughs> Living up to your reputation. Indeed. So one more convention that I've discovered is something called Tabletop Gaming Live, which is done in Nodnol on the 28th and 29th of September. Apparently, they have a repertoire of 400 games available for your gaming pleasure. Yeah, this is new. This is because I went to Tabletop Gaming Live last year. Mm-hmm. And it's the one that was a little bit weird because it felt like they were expecting a lot more people than were actually there. But at the same time, it felt like it was a good first step. Mm. And one thing they were missing was a gaming library. They had loads of open gaming space, but no, not really much of a library which to play with. And that's really good news, actually. So if they're going to have this 400 game library there, yeah. that's a step in the right direction. Mm. So I'd like to think that they heard your uh, mention of this previously they've taken notes and they've done something about it <laughs> i'd love to think that as well i know it's not true but i'd love to think it's Isn't hubris wonderful <laughs> <laughs> i should also mention tabletop scotland ah uh, yes I've been in touch 
Mm. Now, I need to look it up now. Man looks up thing on the internet because I forgot to put this onto your notes. That must have been one of the news ferrets that didn't come back. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> it got eaten by a wild haggis. It got rerouted, found its way back to uh, Polyhedron C HQ rather than the satellite office. Honestly, you'd think it's no- it would know where its pen was by now. I'm not sure. No one asked you. What was that? Bloody Alexa. Alexa's butting in. <laughs> uh, so, Tabletop Scotland is 24th and 25th of August in Perth. So, I've just found some more of the ferrets. And these ones have come back with some gaming news. Do you guys know what the most popular game of 2018 in the UK was? Without looking at the notes. Was it that one where you step on poo? I was about to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. Thank God. Apparently, the most, uh, the best-selling game in 2018 in the UK was Double. Really? Really? With over a million copies. Good Lord. That's impressive. Funny you should say that. We were at something. We were at a Christmas do to do with Amanda School, so it was like a Christmas charity thing where the PTA raised money. My wife's a teacher. And we saw some random kids playing Double there and then. They kind of got in the corner to play Double to get away from all the parents and other rubbish going on. I was like, <laughs> eh, okay, this is influenced, this is, you know, integrated its way into uh, that kind of quick game in your pocket kind of thing. Steve, mm. be honest. Did you then go and join them so that you could get away from all the parents and the other <laughs> <laughs> teachers? I was tempted. <laughs> mm. I must admit. Nice. Did you break out Mansions of Madness? Right, boys and girls, you've played the small game, now play the big one. (laughs) (laughs) I'd love to be able to just carry that round and (laughs) pop it out whenever. Ha! Gaming time! Nice. (laughs) As if by magic, Cthulhu appeared. No, it's just Steve. It's all right. So carting that thing round, I can imagine it had to be easier to summon actual Cthulhu. I think it would, especially... Well, you've seen all the expansions I've got. It now weighs more than (laughs) I do. It's ridiculous. The, bo- the lid will not shut. There's two inches of lid that pokes up above now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You need some better boxes. It's got a... Well, I need more. Yeah, I need a, a bigger box. Um, it's now almost got a Kallax cube of its own. That's good going. It is. It's huge now. Speaking of expansions, uh, there is the third and final edition to the Century Spice Road series coming out, which is A New World. Ooh. I'm very looking forward to this. Mm. Yeah. Sounds. We've enjoyed the other ones. You can play all three together as well, apparently. Yes, I think that was that was always the plan, that mm. you can play the first one, the second one independently. You can mix the first two, so then ultimately you'll be able to mix. I think. Am I right in thinking that you could mix one, two, and three, one and two, one and three, and two and three? Yes. Wow, that's going to take some doing. So yeah. you guys have both got the first two, am I right? Yes. Indeed. Have either of you played both the first two together? Yes. Ah. Was it good? Uh, yes, actually. I was going to talk about it later, but now's as good a time as any. No, no, we can, <laughs> we can come back to it. There's still more news. <laughs> well, now you see, now, now I've started. I'm going to do a Magnus, Magnuson. It won't take long. I mean, for anyone who's familiar with it, basically it adds the cards, the merchant cards from um, Spice Road. So you get the choice of using the tiles on the board for new um, for what's it called Eastern Wonders, where you move your boat around, or you can use the cards that you hold. So you can kind of get the choice between actions, but you can only use cards to move your boat around. So you've got to gather a few in your hand first, and you play them a bit like in Spice Road, but you never have the objective cards in that from Spice Road, so they're still on the board. So you've got to be a bit more considered, and there's a lot more hand management involved. It's a lot slower and a bit more thinky, but it's very good. Hmm. Okay. More thinky, you say? Yes, more thinky. Because you've got to... The way you play it is, in order to... You can play a card, so basically, like, play, say, a trade card where, you know, you turn three red into two brown and a green or whatever it is. Play that on, like, the left of your board. But then you can use any cards that you've played on the left of your board. You can discard them to the right, and that'll move your boat, the number of spaces that you of cards you discard. Or you can discard cards straight from your hand. So you can kind of use cards twice if you're clever about it. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. It's very good. But, yeah, it's, it's a lot heavier. There's mm. a much greater focus on, uh, on hand management and, and thinking further ahead about which actions you want to do because you can combine them. And sometimes you'll get the same action in your hand as you will on the board. 
So it's like, oh, which one's more efficient? Do I go there first and then play a card, or do I do that? And then, yeah, so there's there's a more, more there's a more to it. It'll be interesting to see how this third and final aspect adds to it because apparently uh, it now includes exploration and survival. So if two of them together were thinky, just imagine how three of them, where you've got to explore and survive whilst shipping your goods and combining the goods in the right order. <laughs> that sounds good. So I wonder if the survival, because it's a new world, I wonder if it'll have pirates in it. Arr. Well, it's got a big bear on the cover, so maybe you've got to stop yourself from bear attacks. Hmm. By becoming a master fur trapper. Indeed. <laughs> in the new world. If anyone who's played Sid Meier's colonisation should get that joke. And if you haven't, it'll fall flatter than an ironing board. Indeed. So I thought that sounded interesting. While we're on the subject of expansion still, there is a new addition to Captain Sonar, the massively multiplayer board game involving real-time hidden strategy against one another, which adds campaign mode. Now, I have, I'm somewhat sceptical about this because I've seen... I've never played it myself, but I've seen Captain Sonar played and it is crazy chaotic but you need eight players is it yes i yes that you can play it with less there's enough rules in there's variations of the rules to play it with less players but it is designed for eight people now we have difficulty getting three of us together to play gloomhaven yeah how on earth would you get enough people together regularly to play a campaign that involves eight people I don't know. Maybe this uh, this edition has uh, you know works better with fewer people, and and therefore mm. it would be okay. But it strikes me that this might be quite a limited audience for this one. Now, one thing I will say is Captain Stone is quite quick. True. You could play. You, I think if you know what you're doing which most people don't, which is half the fun of Captain Stone now. <laughs> but I seem to remember that a game lasts about half an hour. If that. Okay. Yeah. So if you're really good at it, it's even quicker. But I, I seem to remember we played, like, including, like, learning the rules, the last time we played it, about an hour and a half, we got two games in. Mm. That's Might about have right. even been three. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I have it. Do you have it? No, I don't. Uh, I, I thought John did for some reason. No. No, I do. Never, never even played it. You guys played it without me at some convention, I think. Uh, I played it in Worcester uh, in our board gaming group there uh, and I brought it in and uh, that was fun with uh, all of the heavy Euro fans <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love to see that <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> it was it was good fun and I have it in the expansion although I've, I've not actually played my copy of it yet yay but uh, I, I'm ten- I tend to agree with you John it, it just seems to be a Either you play it at a convention or you play it at your regular board gaming group. You play sort of two or three games in one go, put it back in the box for three months and then go back to it later. Mm. So we'll keep our eye out on that one. But it's, it was intriguing, the idea of a campaign mode for that particular game. <laughs> yes. So there is a new game coming out from Next Move, the designers of Reef and Azul. And this one's called Tuki. I think I'm pronouncing that right which kind of looks a little bit like a, a Tetris-like game in which you're, you're having to try and stack blocks in particular orders as the, uh, the cards that crop up dictate. I'm looking at pictures of this now, and I, I was about to say, nah, because mm-hmm. I like Azul. It's a really nice game, but then they brought out Azul 2, stained, stained glass windows, and then they brought out <laughs> Reef. <laughs> And I kind of thought, I don't have enough room in my collection for all these games. And I've just seen a picture of this and went, ooh, hello, this looks interesting. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it looks interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to see how this one's going to play. But if you like uh, number nine and games like that, in which you're trying to stack awkwardly shaped pieces together, why doesn't this one fit? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this could be a winner. And, I mean, they've always been good with the previous games. Azul we liked, Reef we liked. I've yet to try Reef, actually. I've not played it, but I have watched many playthroughs. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. I may or may not have it on order. Ooh. So, yeah, keep your eyes peeled on that one. I think it's going to be a winner. And finally, one more bit I was going to mention on the games front, sort of games, our cousin podcast... I'm going to start calling them The Secret (laughs) Cabal. (laughs) So The Secret Cabal recently did a sort of introspection piece on how they're set up, 
how they approach reviewing things, how they approach the board game community and what their motivations are for doing all this stuff. And I've always thought that they sound like a similar bunch of people to us. And when I heard this piece, I couldn't help thinking they're basically us, but American. <laughs> so, so rather than us being the European secret cabal, are you now saying that the secret cabal are the American polyhedron collider, are you? Yeah, well, it'll be another controversial piece that'll irritate Tony, so let's bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I mean, you could look at it either way. It's a matter of perspective, right? In any case, the Secret Cabal are working on an RPG tips and tricks kind of book. So this is some ideas sort of building on their uh, Dungeon Master's Ludus idea of giving new DMs some ideas about where to go. This is a book building on the same sorts of ideas. Just thought it sounded interesting, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. I'm not quite sure when it's going to be out, but... I've been following that closely because I backed the Kickstarter for that one. Aha! Ooh. There you go. So uh, it should be coming via the uh, electronic books as soon as it's ready. In fact, it has gone quiet for some time, so I was quite impressed when uh, Jamie released the cover art for it. Nice. Am I right in thinking that Steve from their podcast did all the artwork as well? Sure, I heard that. I don't think it's the cover. I think it's going to be the internal artwork. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> but just Steve's... Steve's... Yeah, Steve. I think it's not far off that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> Speaking of Kickstarter. Ah, uh, yes. The Kickstarter ah. ferrets have just arrived back. Oh, yeah, there's <laughs> quite a few of them. There are. <laughs> and one of them is talking about a game that you should be backing, Mr. Cage. Well, so Munchkin Dungeon, I'm assuming it's that one you're talking about. Yes. Is now yes. live. And the minis look very nice. It looks like it captures the essence of some of the bits that I really liked about Munchkin, in that you get to stab your buddies in the back, competitively trying to become the most high-level, most respected character in the game. But I don't think I'm going to back this one. The thing is, I haven't played the get the board game, the card game for a very long time. In any case, but um, it doesn't look really any different to that card game yes there's a board there yes there's some nice minis but it didn't seem like from the the bits and pieces that i've watched online that there was anything that was like ah yeah okay that's some cool new and fun elements to it that i would mm. that i could justify spending some money on okay i thought that exact same thing mr cage because i was under the impression this was going to be similar to arcadia quest so i was really excited for this some kind of crazy dungeon crawler based on, you know, loosely based on Munchkin, but mm -hmm. it seems to be Munchkin on a board. Yeah. I was just like, well, no, because I think Munchkin is one of the most worst games I think I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Would you, here we go, I'm going to put you on the spot now, Steve. Would you rate it above or below Talisman and Betrayal at House on the Hill? Well, let's put it into context. I've played Betrayal at the House on the Hill four times. Mm -hmm. It took me that long to determine, no, this game is crap. I played Munchkin once <laughs> and came to that conclusion. What about Talisman? Well, uh, see, I'm gonna, I'm, I am going to have to say Talisman is better than Betrayal at the House on the Hill. So at the moment, yes. it's Munchkin is at the bottom, followed by Betrayal, followed by Talisman. Wow. Talisman is the best shit game that Steve has. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> we, can, we can edit that last bit out. I think it only took me two playthroughs of Betrayal to work out that it is an utter turd. Uh, I've played Munchkin <laughs> once to realise the same thing, and I've played Talisman once. So in terms of uh, um, achieving a conclusion, I have been more efficient. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I think in a weird kind of way, I think I actually preferred Munchkin. Not by much, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're picking, you know, we're picking glitter out of a turd here. But... Uh... <laughs> So I would argue that both Talisman, Munchkin, they fit into a certain bracket of games. Shit that games. Work, mm. Games. <laughs> that work better. <laughs> you bastards. That work better when you have the right group of people together. Blind ones. No. Yeah, but if you say that, John, there's much better games to play. That's true. I think there are certain groups of people that wouldn't appreciate those games in actual fact. Idiots. <laughs> Lighter oh, gamers, people newer to the gaming sport. Yeah, no, yeah, but I still think ta I still think Talisman and Munchkin are crap games, even for them. I think there's much, much better games to be playing with lighter gamers. Mm. 
I think actually I'm surprised that they're reprinting Talisman. I'm surprised that there's that much of a market for that game still because like there are there are much much better games to introduce new gamers to. Will agree to disagree. <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> let's just say there are many games out there, and this is uh, just adding Crap. to the choice. <laughs> Right, so, before you guys stamp me down again, <laughs> something else that cropped up on my radar on the, the old Kickstarter front is something called Chocolatiers, which, don't make it rude, Andy, I can see the smirk. As if I would. <laughs> it's a family-friendly game with elements of card drafting, set collection and pattern building, which are all things that I like. Uh, it's, I suspect, pretty straightforward. From the, uh, the the few glimpses I've seen of it. Looking at its campaign, it looks very simple. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that one with the uh, lanterns. Yes. I was oh. going to say, it does seem a little bit like lanterns. I quite like lanterns. So. Oh, it's actually called lanterns. I couldn't remember what it was called. I just know it had lanterns <laughs> in it. <laughs> it is called lanterns. Um, yeah, essentially you're trying to make a box of chocolates... It's a bit like life, really. See, looking at this, it reminds me of Table Tantrums. Table Tantrums. I don't think I've played that. No, don't. don't. No, just don't. <laughs> they set in unison. Good God. That, that's 20 minutes of our lives we're not getting back. 20 minutes is 40. I played it twice. Oh, good Lord, you poor bastard. <laughs> Essentially, you're trying to match up various bits of chocolate. You're trying to place your tiles so that you can match up different types of chocolate together, scoring... Basically trying to score sequences of those. And if you do that, you score more points. And whoever has the prettiest box, Snigger, at the end of the game wins. So quite a simplistic one, I suspect. But it looked like fun. Okay. So that's Chocolatiers. Not to be mistaken for Chocolate Factory. No, I think that's something else. Yes, it is. Very much so. It is. Is that the one with the conveyor belt? Yes. yes. Okay, so going from something light, let's try something... Deeper and darker and bigger and more better, I reckon, for you guys, which is something called Hyperspace, mm. a new 4X uh, asymmetric yes. sci fi, which looks deep. Yeah. Eye wateringly expensive. Yes, it is. I saw this, uh, was it last week, I think it was, maybe a week before, and it did sort of tweak my, my interest for the reasons you have cited. It's bigger, it's fatter, it's 4X, it's in space. Um, etc, etc, etc but it is something like 150 quid for the lot which in the grand scheme of things I suppose isn't an enormous amount of money compared to other games I may have received in the last 12 months but, No Andy, let's stop right there, it is an enormous amount of money for a board game Yeah it is, but that's, that's kind of the problem because I've got Eclipse and Eclipse was £45 and there is a veritable shitload in that box and it's a bloody good game, so I am struggling to see how hyperspace would do better. Mm -hmm. It does look really interesting. I, I got to admit, it's Peterson Games, yeah. mm -hmm. who are the people behind Cthulhu Wars, and it's Sandy Peterson who is the Lord of All Call of Cthulhu. And so it's coming from like this this good back catalogue of board games. Although I don't, I've never seen many reviews of. Although most people seem to have said that uh, Cthulhu Wars is quite good, they released another one last year, and I don't think I've heard much buzz about that. And it does look pretty cool. Oh, I've just realised as well. Oh, the little, you know, the little player icons. You know, get inside the, the box. It's like two to four players, mm. an age of players. The little player is a little Cthulhu. <laughs> oh. And it's on the phone, the age thing. He's got a little birthday cake in front of him. That's it. Steve's backed it. Good God. So yeah, I had a quick look at this, and I agree. It looks very, very nice, but there wasn't enough about it to grab me, especially in the world when there was Eclipse, there's Twilight Imperium, there's that other one that I've got sitting on my shelf that he's playing. Mm, I'm intrigued, but not enough, like Steve says. I'm going to stick with Eclipse. It's kind of like doing the come hither and entice me option, but it's not grabbing me and dragging me in. Not by the short and curlies. Indeed. So we'll keep an eye on that one. I'm not sure it's pulled me in yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. Tempted, Mr Cage, Ooh. by a big, expensive Kickstarter. Yeah. What, what is this new devilry? <laughs> or I could just do what I normally do, which is talk about it and then not actually back it. <laughs> uh. That sounds about right, yeah. Mm. We will see. We will see. <laughs> or the other option, back it 
uh, rave about it, and then play it once. <laughs> <laughs> That's standard behaviour for board gamers. I still haven't played my copy of City of Kings yet. <laughs> oh, dear. I know. That's dreadful, despite having received the expansion quite recently. Well, this weekend, there may be an opportunity for all three of us to play a game together. Bum, that is bum, true. Bum. Nah, it won't work out. No. <laughs> Something will come along and scupper it. Mm. Well, you've already said one of you is available Saturday and the other one's available Sunday, so... I've been rearranging plans. Ooh. Sunday could be a winner. Ooh. Never let it be said that I don't bend over backwards to uh, fulfil my obligations to the PHC. <laughs> Stop picturing that, Tudor. Right, uh, let's oh, move on. Oh, matron oh. is all I'm going to say to that. Oh. Dead Man's Cabal. You guys heard of this? No. No. So, Pandasaurus... Responsible for Dead of Winter, Dinosaur Island, good stuff hey, like that. Dead of Winter was plaid hat. Yeah. I have poor information. You do. I think you need to beat one of your ferrets, as it were. What I meant, bad <laughs> ferrets. Very bad ferrets. Yeah, that's right, you cower. Uh, sorry, what I meant to say was Dinosaur Island, The Mind and Machikoro. There, there we go. go. Because that's you know very similar to Dead of Winter, both in style, theme and name. Yeah, I think I copied down the wrong bit there. <laughs> you mean it's come from David Gilmore, the designer of Dead of Winter and there Dinosaur Island? There you go. That's more like it. There we go. What have I told you, Ferret, about mixing the information? Honestly, you can't get a staff these days. Imagine you're a necromancer throwing a ball, but you don't have any friends because you're a bit of a creepy undead necromancer kind of guy. Oh, you mean, right, as in a dis a dance rather than I thought you mean like throwing a ball for a dog. <laughs> Why would a necromancer do that? <laughs> oh, Here, skeleton, go fetch. <laughs> <laughs> Run, dead net, dead spot. Run. <laughs> I've just got oh, an my. image of a zombie now. <sighs> <sighs> With a ball in his mouth. <laughs> Something wrong with you people. <laughs> so, no, y you are throwing an. How do I rephrase this? A party. Not a sexy party before you get. Do you know what? I think I prefer my version now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Necromancer you... fetch. Someone needs to make that game. You go for it. In the meantime, <laughs> <laughs> Dead Man's Cabal is a game in which you are competing to try and throw the best party. So you are vying to get the to bring back the best dead guests. Described as a bit of a gateway game to more complex games, so you know, I might be able to play this one. <laughs> they described it as a variable phase selection game. Which I thought was an interesting phrase that I've not. Who was that? Is it set, set in a laser lab? I think what they're getting at is that you each get a private action that you can choose from, and then there's a public action that affects everyone. Okay. So it's a question of balancing what's good for you versus what's bad for other people while fitting into your longer term strategies, is the kind of gist of it, which sounds like the right sort of combination to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do I win now or do I dick Steve over now? Hmm. <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> Dickery it is. Always choose the dick weight. <laughs> so it promises uh, nice simple rules but deep strategy potential, which sounds like... I'm scanning for this Kickstarter page and this sounds like the most bonkers board game I've seen in, in, ever. It seems like someone's mashed together like 20 little mini-games. That is an interesting point, because that was the same conclusion that I reached from what I read about it. But I'd really like to see more of a, an in-depth playthrough before we um, form a more thorough opinion of it. Just sounded... It was enough to intrigue me. Mm. So that is Dead Man's Cabal. One final news item is Tenfold Dungeon. So this is just something that's spotted up on my list of bits and pieces, which is a lightweight, reconfigurable board game system. If you're, if you're doing RPGs, dungeon crawlers, that kind of thing, it's one box that opens out a bit like iSchool opens out and the board becomes... Sorry, the box becomes the board. Same sort of idea here. So the actual box unfolds into lots of smaller box that produces a board that you can then configure in various different... Uh, aspects 
just thought it was like an interesting idea. My worry with it is how versatile that bit would be longer term. Yeah, because surely there's only there's only so many ways you can stick that thing together with before it comes, oh, we're in that room, right, okay. We'll yeah. see. Yeah, I'd say that that's quite common with most tile sets, though, with, like, dungeon crawling stuff. Mm. You say that, but I haven't even used the three boxes of tiles I bought for D&D yet. Referring to our earlier points of buy now, never play later. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, I thought it was an interesting idea. So that is also on Kickstarter now. And that concludes the news for this week. I'm going to click the remind me button on that one. Ooh. There you go. I thought that might. I reckon that'd be quite cool for Infinity. Oh, yeah. There's a sci fi version on there. There is, yeah. Oh. Ooh. Let's talk about some games we've been playing then, boys. Oh, uh, all right then. Who would like to go first? We've heard enough from John, so it should be me or Andy. Go on then, Steve. <laughs> you go Gosh. first. <laughs> so, most of this week I have not been playing games. I have instead <laughs> been gluing inserts together. In fact, I've been doing I've been, I've been knee deep in PVA glue. So I had a uh, back defaulted space Kickstarter. <laughs> That's his story and he's sticking to previously. it. Previously. <laughs> he's been it, eating yes. it straight from the jar. <laughs> So I backed the Folded Space Kickstarter, which is the previous Kickstarter, because they've just uh, finished one a couple of months back. And I suddenly, with the new Kickstarter coming out a couple of weeks back, I suddenly thought maybe I should build the ones I ordered from the last Kickstarter. So the last few weeks, I've been putting them all together. It accumulated yesterday in me finally building the Gloomhaven insert. To give you an idea of how long it took, it took three Game of Thrones episodes. That's, That's a three significant hours. amount of time. Yes, because I decided to put some Game of Thrones on in the background because I'm also trying to rewatch all of Game of Thrones again before the new season starts, which may have been a foolish idea. I meant to ask you, how are you watching them? I bought them all on DVD when they uh... came out on DVD. I'm missing, I think, the final series, I think, so I'm going to have to buy that as we get closer to the, the actual date, but... Yeah, I actually sucked up the money and bought everything on DVD and then Blu-ray once I got a Blu-ray player. So there's a point where it jumps from standard depth to high depth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to find a figure out a way of actually watching the new series because I don't have Sky anymore. Ooh. Just get Now TV. That is a good idea. Yeah, And then you can cancel it as soon as Game of Thrones finishes, Boom. which 90% of their audience are going to do. Do you know what? Actually, I was um, I was listening to an article, it must have been, was it just after the, uh, just before or just after the last series of Game of Thrones, and it was the sort of the CEO of uh, Now TV, and he was commenting on like their sales figures or something, and how much money they'd made. And he says, that, yeah, we, we actually saw something like a 98% drop-off of, uh, of subscribers at like this one particular date, and it just happened to be the day after the uh, the Game of Thrones series finished. And he said, "We couldn't work out why." <laughs> well, that's probably the political answer. Obviously, they're aware. <sighs> so, what do you think of folded space inserts, Steve? So uh, I am that impressed. I've ordered some more. Um, they are like a fa- uh, like a foam sandwich. So it's like a, mm, a foam with foam. like plastic on either side um, and they're pre-cut so you have to glue them together with PVA glue which is the kind of time consuming bit and of course the Gloomhaven insert is ridiculous It's I got a, a couple of LCG box inserts I got an insert for Eldritch Horror and I bought the Gloomhaven one and it probably took me same time to put together all the other inserts as it did to put just the Gloomhaven one together because it was that many little boxes to glue hmm. but they're nice and simple is it basically foam core? Uh, yes, but rather than most foam core tends to be like a paper, mm. uh, like a cardboard on the outside. This is more like a vinyl. Oh, okay, right, sure. But it, it's essentially the same kind of stuff. Mm. And you just glue it, to, it. It's all slots together. It's all like um, toothed, such like to form joints. And you just you just put PVA glue across the joints, and you know, a couple of hours they're dry and they're pretty sturdy. The one thing I did make a mistake on is I bought the Eldritch Horror uh, insert. Mm. And then realised even on the description, it's designed for the base game and one small box expansion. <laughs> How many expansions have you got, Steve? All the small box expansions, which I think is four of them, and two of the big box expansions. Oops. Oops, indeed. So, yes, it wouldn't all fit. So I ended up actually taking the Netrunner insert 
and put it into one of the second Eldritch Horror boxes, which actually worked out quite well because I've got all the ma- all the basic components now in one box, apart from all the uh, kind of Great Old One related stuff because you get a different deck of cards for every single Great Old One. Mm-hmm. So they're all nicely organised in that box, which is pretty cool. Mm. Nice. So I'm quite impressed. I've already ordered the Mountains of Madness one and the Carcass on one from the next round, and I'm going to have to reorder another Netrunner one now since I've just bastardised that. <laughs> Oops. Oh, well done. Yeah, really impressed by them. I'm going to keep an eye out on the future Kickstarters. And of course, they do. They, what they do is they do a Kickstarter for like a, like a season, as it were, uh, which funds the ne- design and build of the next like 10 or 20 uh, inserts. Okay. But they're quite cheap. So I think the Gloomhaven one was the most expensive one, I think about £20. Mm. And the rest of them were around about 10 to £15 each. That's not so which bad. You, when you compare them to like the Broken Token ones, like the Broken Token ones, like... 40, 50 quid over here for the standard mm. ones. Yeah, they're the wooden ones, aren't they? Yeah, they're the laser cut wood yeah. ones, yeah. Now, Adam has got the broken token insert for Gloomhaven, so I've got that as a direct comparison. I will say the broken token one is a bit better because it also comes with things like tuck boxes. And it also comes with What's uh, a tuck more, box. Um like a like a fag box, really. Like a cigarette box. So it's a just a cardboard box that you put cards into. It folds over. It folds over. Yeah. So what it is is it's got the box ready. So all the monster cards for each type of monster goes into a little box, mm-hmm. and then just keeps them all separate basically. And a lot of the trays from the uh, broken token one are segregated into smaller because it's using wood. It can go a bit tighter, is it? If that makes sense. Uh-huh. So like the uh, status tokens is a tray with all the status tokens in a separate little compartment. So you just take that tray out and put it aside the board. Hmm. The folded space one is like one big pocket for them all. So you've got to fish around and get that token out. Can't help but feel that broken tokens are a bad name for a company that makes things to protect tokens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I guess um, really carefully, perfectly kept tokens is a bit wordy. <laughs> doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? No. I keep seeing Final Space and thinking it's like the same as... Sorry, not Final Space. I keep seeing Folded <laughs> Space and thinking it's Final Space. <laughs> okay, Doody Pop! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dear. I loved that program. It was great. That was that was brilliant, that cartoon. Was. Yeah, it was. It was superb. I like the way you use your words. <laughs> God damn it, Gary! <laughs> The Gary. It's just Gary! <laughs> <laughs> now what get out of here, Kevin. I hate you. The other thing which I have been gluing together with PVA glue and making a complete, complete mess is Vector Race Formula 8, hmm. which is very similar in style to... Gaslands. That racing game. That's the one, Gaslands. So what this is, is a racing game. Ooh. And it's got a X-Wing style um, template system. So what you do is at the end of each round, you choose what gear you're going to go into. And so you select the stick for that gear, which determines how far you're going to travel and how tight a corner you can turn. Just like Gaslands. You basically just lay out a track on the board, on on whatever surface you want, and just do a race. And what's really cool is you've got uh, special tokens. You've got... uh, Nitro tokens and you've got tire tokens. So nitro tokens allow you to do boosts, allow you to travel faster, whereas tire tokens allow you to slam your brakes on and to reduce speed quicker or to take corners tighter. Hmm. What's also pretty cool is the game has got a little bit of drafting and shunting rules. So if you end up a certain distance away from the car in front, you can automatically move up to them and then you can spend a nitro token to move in front of them. Yeah, okay. And then what happens is turn order changes. So at the end of every round, it goes in like pole position kind of order. So whoever's in front always goes first. Mm-hmm. It's really quite simple. Mm-hmm. As I said, it's it's similar to Gaslands and X-Wing and that kind of thing in style. Uh, and you've got these cute little cardboard, like NASCAR racing cars. I mentioned the glue because you have to glue these things together, like the things you used to get like free on a cover of a magazine when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. So it's all folds and tabs <laughs> and such like. Something which I haven't done in donkey's years, so the mine do look a bit ropey. But <laughs> on the table, they don't look too bad. For some reason, I can't get the boot to stay down. They all look like they've like just come out the skip with the <laughs> boot not hooked proper. He's just been to Ikea and he can't get the boot lid closed. <laughs> yeah. Have you just been ramming the cars? 
Is that what it is? <laughs> is there contact in it? Or is it purely um, just a race? Do, there, there is a shunt action you can do, which is can move people to one side. You can block people, but most of it is just a race. Mm. It's not like a... It's basically like a, a variation on NASCAR would be the best way to describe it. Most of it is basically just about carefully using your resources to determine like when to accelerate, when to brake, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. when to use your tyres. It's also got a little wee pit stop as well. So you've got all these like brake tokens, and so if you run out of brake tokens, you can go back to the pit stop and replenish them. Nice. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Sounds a lot like things like Flam Rouge and what's that other one? Downforce. That's not what I was thinking of, but a good answer. So yes, it is probably... Um, a cr- I've not played Flam Rouge, but I do know the concept of the game, and yeah, it's a little bit of a cross between like... Flam Rouge and X-Wing would be the way oh, I put okay. it. Cool. Interesting. It's really simple. Really quite fun. There is something quite... As I said, it's got that little X-Wing element of it. It's really quite cool going, ah, crap, I should have gone down another gear last, last turn. Or, oh, bugger, if I'd stayed in third gear then, I could have actually got around and got in front of you kind of thing. What do you mean you've got a roll special ability? You're not going to be there where I need you to be. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I can't use you to assist my braking. <laughs> It's really quite clever as well because you can make the ta- you can make the course wherever you want to be. You just put some tokens out to represent which, where where the bends are, mm. and then you know cars have to just go the correct side of that little corner token. So you can play it out. You can play a massive course like covering the entire living room floor, or you can make a little wee one on your coffee table or something. Yes, sounds like fun. Mm. Simple but fun. Yes. Okay. Nice. What about you, Mister Lewis? What have you been playing? I have been playing Root, Mm -hmm. which has received quite a lot of press over the last 12 months or so. Um, It's received quite a lot of positive press. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I thought a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to buy it and find out what all the fuss is about. So I did. And it's expansion, of course. Of course. Of course. And my first game was an unmitigated disaster. Because I got some rules wrong. Oops. Yeah, it, it turns out if uh, if you get a couple of the rules wrong, the game is hideously imbalanced. And I walked away from that game thinking, this is shit! How the hell are you supposed to play this? And then Alora said, I've watched a video and we were definitely playing some rules wrong. Oh! So then I went back and went, oh yeah, that would make a difference. But anyway, the premise of Root... We seem to be making a bit of a habit of that, don't we? Yes, yeah, you, playing, and, you and I are doing well on that front. Playing games in Iron Man mode where it's virtually impossible to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We just like more of a challenge. That's that's all it is, right? That's what it is, yes. Uh, I overestimated my abilities, unfortunately. <laughs> Root is a game of wood, is it wood, woodland uh, might and... Um, not majesty, something else. Um, mastery. Mastery, that's it. And basically, you play one of a number of asymmetric factions. One being the Marquise de Cat, who's essentially some kind of sort of brutal dictator who's trying to take over the, the forest and essentially cut it down and build buildings. I presume uh, you, you played that one, then? Uh, no, actually, I did not. Um, there's the Eerie, which are essentially the dis- deposed former rulers of the forest, so basically kicked out by the cat who are not too happy at said uh, deposition. Uh, That's who I played and screwed up. You've got the Woodland Alliance, who are... I mean, we could put this in Star Wars terminology. You've essentially got the Eerie, which are kind of like the form of Empire. You've got the Marquise de Cat, which is the... whatever the new Empire became in, in, like, Episode 7. You've got the Woodland Alliance, which are basically the Rebels. And then you've got the fourth sort of base box faction, which is the Vagabond. So they're sort of little badger-type creatures or uh, raccoons who sort of run in, run in between the forest and are essentially, I suppose, basically like Boba Fett. So they'll work for both sides. <laughs> they just work for themselves. Yeah, it's kind of like Han Solo, Boba Fett, that kind of thing. You know, basically they'll work for cash and whoever pays the most. But the beautiful thing about Root is it's, it's extremely asymmetric. There are some common actions, like movement or attack and stuff like that, but the strategies and the mechanics governing each of the the factions is so wildly different that each each side has very, very different strategies, so they interact differently. So the 
the objective basically for the cat is to essentially maintain a, a wood network essentially because they score points by building buildings. Uh, the eerie score points by essentially maintaining dominance of the board basically. You score more points for getting basically roosts down. The Woodland Alliance score points by forming bases and gaining popularity uh, and then if they get attacked they lose uh, you lose a token but it makes it very hard for the enemy to a get a foothold in the areas they've controlled but also they gain sympathy so they essentially become more popular hmm. so they gain points by basically gaining sympathy and the vagabond gains points by essentially playing both sides so you sort of work for both sides you, you essentially you can either help them out or you can actually get in their way trade items for favors basically so that's how they score points and they, they, they do little quests as well so very very different ways of playing first person to 30 points wins and the game sort of ends very quickly and abruptly at that point it's not sort of don't finish the round it's basically whoever gets there first and i have to say it's very very clever i really love it that's quite a turnaround <laughs> it is it is this is why i thought well do you know what i'm i'm, I'm gonna give it another go because you can't just turn around and play it once admittedly get it wrong and then decide something's crap so i played it again um with Alora first time so first time i played it as the eerie and got it wrong and the reason i got it brutally wrong is because the eerie's mechanics basically it's essentially hand management and you play a card into a set of four silos essentially one of them is like move one's recruit one's fight and the other one's build and you got to do them in that order but you've always got to play a hat a card into at least one of those things each time so you're slightly beholden to the deck which is where the skill comes in and you have the basically the cards have matching suits which match certain areas of the board so you can play those cards in those areas basically and if you don't have the matching card for the eerie you get punished and essentially the whole thing falls over and you lose points but i played it in like as you say iron man mode where basically i lost points for every card i had rather than just specific <laughs> ones <laughs> So every time I'd gained like 10 points, I lost them all again. I thought, this is ridiculous. How the hell are you supposed to do this? Not like that. Not yeah. like that, no. And also you can move more people around, which I got wrong as well, but it doesn't matter. So we played it again, and I won that one. Although the game was really, really tight, it wasn't a runaway victory. Because of the, the way each side gains points, essentially a cat can't lose points, and it gains points really, really, really quickly. But then it gets to a point where it has to start pushing against its enemies at which point it starts obviously to become a lot more difficult for it to gain points. You've then got the Woodland Alliance, which are more of a slow burn. They take a long time to get going, but once they do, they're extremely difficult to stop. And then you've got the, um, the Vagabond, where it's extremely difficult to interact with the Vagabond as, a, as another player, because they just basically keep darting between various locations, and you can't directly interact with them unless you catch them when they're in the open and you just basically knock them on the head and tell them to piss off. Gosh. Yeah, it's it's very, very clever, actually. Extremely well-balanced. Because I played a uh, three-player with Luke from our sort of Worcester board gaming group as well, so we've, we've essentially played all of the factions now, so we know how they all work. And the game was really, really, really close. So like, there's only like two or three victory points in it all the way up through. So it's one of those games that you've, you've got to keep going and keep up with everyone else. And to be fair, it's kind of relatively straightforward to do that provided you don't make such a massive screw up of it and then obviously you know there's there's a thing that will tip the balance combat's quite straightforward you attack you roll two dice one person takes the higher number the other one takes the lower you take tokens off matching those numbers and that's basically it so the hardest thing about it is teaching it because you've essentially got to teach four games <laughs> or just leave everyone to read their own faction and get on with it yes i would say that but the rule book isn't great hmm. um it's it leaves a lot of questions like it omits really sensible things like the turn order i did look at the rule book for this and was quite surprised by the format of it it was not the most straightforward or understandable of documents i must admit no i it, there, there are four rule books basically four yeah the look on your face four yeah there's one per faction no <laughs> <laughs> You'd think that would work, but no. There's a there's the sort of basic rule book. It, it kind of almost does the FFG thing of learn to play and then have the reference. There's those two, which are basically mostly the rules. And then there's two mm. more? Yeah, there's one that basically goes through the overview of the game and gives you the set contents and roughly how to play. 
that's like a single sheet of A4, so we just get rid of that. And then there's a kind of this is I'm starting a, to see the problem here, Andy. <laughs> well, no, because it doesn't contain any real information. Here's the quick quick start guide that gives you the gist of the game. No, it doesn't. Do just, then you have the two the two turn <laughs> walkthrough. So you've got essentially three ways to learn the first game. And then you use the rules reference afterwards. And it's it's just so convoluted and they've omitted or made it unclear by doing that. But it's it just left quite a few questions open. Like the everyone has their own turn. They do a complete turn and then it's somebody else's turn, which doesn't sound strange. But each turn is broken up into three phases. And it's not immediately obvious whether you play each phase, then you do the next phase each, and then you do the final phase each, or if you do all of it. Because it's not immediately obvious why you would split the turn up into three phases. Because you're doing them all as one player, and then the next person does all of theirs. So it seems a little illogical. Until you get into it, and there are certain cards that kick off at certain points throughout your, your turn. So there's like certain things that you can do, but only at certain points. So you've got to do, you've got to um, basically time your actions um, carefully, essentially. Mm. So it does make sense once you've played it a couple of times, but learning it the first time is really quite hard. You kind of need to have played it before you play it. <laughs> it's one of those games where you sacrifice the first play, knowing that you're going to probably lose and screw it up royally. So yeah. the next time you might have some clue, except the next time you'll play a different faction and faction, it's back yes. to the beginning. That's exactly right. That is exactly what happened to Alora. <laughs> she played as the cat the first time and she battered me because I got all the rules wrong. And then the second time we stayed the same and I won but only just. And then for the three of three player game, she played as the Woodland Alliance. So she just it was completely different. She's like, How the hell does this work? <laughs> so does that mean by my Three game guide that you know you've got to play wants to learn the rules, wants to learn the strategy, and wants to enjoy the game. Does that mean you now have to play Root 12 times to fully understand it? In yeah. theory, yes. <laughs> I think in reality, no, because once you've played it once or twice, like you know, I think I've played it now four times, you get a, a fairly decent idea of what how the game operates. Yeah. It's just a case of learning the subtleties of each, each faction. That's the and to be fair, the player boards actually kind of guide you through what to do. You know, this is this okay. goes first, then this, then this, then this, then this. You know, you have you have to do these things first. Then you get a choice of actions or whatever format your, your faction takes. Then you do like the clean up at the end, and then it's the next person's go. But the downtime once you get used to it is actually really really low. So each player's turn is only essentially you know you'll you'll draw a card say at the start. You'll put some tokens down. You'll take three actions which don't take long. It usually involve playing a couple of cards. Then you'll draw a final card at the end of the turn, and it's the next person's go. It's really quite quick. I'd really like to try this game. Likewise. I really, really would. It's very, very good. I can see why Sunday, people maybe. like it. Sunday, yes, because the good thing is, once you get used to it, you can get through it in about half an hour, forty minutes. It's very quick. Blimey. Yeah, once I say once you're used to it, <laughs> the first <laughs> game will probably take then. about two hours. <laughs> once you get used to it, okay. but it is very, very good. And I have got the expansion, which adds more factions. I haven't played them yet. I'm still trying to get used to the base box. But I really, really like Root. I think it's an excellent game. And we want to play it Ooh. more and more. And Alora keeps badgering me. Can we play Root? I'm like, yes. Uh -huh. so, badgering you. <laughs> ah, <laughs> see? I'm a genius without even knowing it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you been playing, Mr. Cage? What have I been playing? Yes. It sounds like an expansion to Terraforming Mars, but go on. Onward to Venus is one of the games that I've been playing. With Steve, as it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, I should caveat this to say that we only played a bit of one game. We played a full round, so we got the full experience. A full right. round. Then I can conclude that I like this game because I'm good at it and Steve is shit at it. <laughs> 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 the gist of it is that you need to... You start off on Earth. All the players start off on Earth. And you need to expand across the galaxy to take control of resources on the board and ultimately win victory points. And you do that by holding planets. And to do that, you have to have the most factories, the most mines on that particular resource. So it's kind of composed of a bunch of planet tokens, which just get spread out across the table. Mm -hmm. And you each start with some little spaceships and some little men orbiting Earth. And it's then up to you to decide how to deploy those 
those troops and those spaceships to get your people to the different planets to set things down the planet to either just pick up factories by occupying them or taking over mines which you have to do by fighting and there's a few other bits and pieces that'll earn you victory points along the way like big game basically go out hunting weird alien beasties <laughs> there are options to pick up some bonus cards that give you extra abilities like uh, more options to fight, extra actions, that kind of thing. And you have to maintain a certain amount of money that allows you to build more troops to go down onto the planets. Sounds like Factorio in space. Nothing like Factorio. Uh, it's got factories in it, I'll give you that. Okay. All you build in them is more spaceships and tanks. Okay. So the spaceships allow you to move people around and you need people to take over these various assets. The only thing is that um, once they're down on the planets, that's it. For a, game, for a round in the game, they stay down there. I, I really enjoyed this game. The artwork's really funky. The mechanics and the kind of balancing up how you can get to the resources before your opponent can get to resources and where you need them all to be is really good fun. There's some elements of randomness to it and that when you go down onto a planet to try and, say, take over a mine, you roll a couple of dice and you split the difference between the highest dice and the lowest dice. And that tells you how many additional fighty things that you need to take over that particular mine. So a mine will have something like a two on it, which means you need two troops and spaceships tra count for one of these as well. Uh, to take over that but there's always a variable amount you don't know that until you say i'm going to go and take over this mine roll the dice crap i've got a one and a six i need five fight on top of the mine's toughness oh my god <laughs> and you've rolled a skull and crossbones which means one of your units is dying in the process oh dear that's right yeah you're taking casualties ah. so i played this again during the week so ah. i played a full game against adam how'd it go very, very well. In fact, I will say that one of the reasons why I said we should talk about it after you seen just one round is you'd see everything you need to see in one round because what you do is, is just you rinse and repeat again two more times, mm -hmm. but with people already uh, controlling things. And we found that game went really quick. I mean, another, I reckon another 20 minutes and we could have finished that game off we were playing. Don't forget there was the John factor in there as well. Uh, okay, 40 minutes then. <laughs> <laughs> I get I'm definitely guilty of analysis paralysis. I'm sat there mm. trying to make the perfect set of moves, which I might add I did. <laughs> True. I I really want to play this game with more players because I played it with Adam, so I played it two players again. And looking at the difference between a two and player game and like a five player game, the amount of resources is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So you're still fighting over the same amount of resources. And I thought with two players, I think they should have been pared down just a little bit more. Mm. Was it a bit too comfortable? You could basically go to either ends of the solar system and ignore each other. Mm. Um, one thing that's worth pointing out, this is all based on a graphic novel, I think. Yeah. So everything has this kind of Victorian steampunk artwork to it as well. Ooh. Interesting. And so you um, you start off with different factions representing different countries on Earth. So you get England, France, Germany, America, that kind of thing. But... That only really affects your starting hand. You get like a starting hand of six cards, oh. which once they're gone, they're gone. Um, but I think the British card just summed this game up, which one of the character cards which added to your combat abilities was Captain Coxwain. <laughs> He's a legend. <laughs> As a picture of him with his big handlebar moustache, a pipe sticking out of his mouth, and a hunting rifle, but the hunting rifle is a laser rifle. Awesome. It's a laser rifle that's got like a blunderbuss end to it. It just yes, <laughs> yeah. The artwork's good fun. Although I did notice that all all the ladies in inverted quotes on the cards, well, they all look like Victorian type pictures, but they kind of look quite mannish. Yes, <laughs> like alarmingly so. <laughs> yeah, I was really impressed by this game, especially considering I only bought it for ten pounds from the works. That was a bargain. I, oh, I was, was going to say, where did you get it? I went hunting in the works after that to try and find it, and I couldn't find it in the one in Morven. I think there's a more discerning board gaming crowd locally, unfortunately. <laughs> there's a works in Malvern? Yeah. Where is it? Yeah. Right in the middle. Opposite, yeah. Um... Opposite Fat Face. Oh, of course, yes, 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 yes. yes. I know, yes, I know what you mean. 
I I didn't actually buy it in the works in store. I bought it online. Ah. I got this and Android mainframe for twenty pounds. Parking. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Um, yeah, I really really enjoyed this, and again, I want to play this with more players because this worked really well. I thought, and I think with more players, it's going to get longer. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a much longer game because I said we played it in about even teaching add on the rules. We played it in about an hour and a half, but I think with you could go up to six players. I think. That must be chaos. <laughs> Six must be chaos. And, and, and how are you going to have enough room to put all the tokens around all the planets? I'm not quite entirely sure with Six players either. Yeah, but, that's true. But you're right. That would be chaos, especially when you start occupying places and you there's some of these them. Is it called trouble? Yes. Or um, not trouble. It's something else. One of the tokens basically allows you to attack and take your enemies' bases. So uh, one of the tokens, one of them tokens came up like right at the very beginning of the game on the planet. So Adam grabbed this really good mine and then basically kept all his forces on this one planet just in case I went after it, which just meant I just scattered to the other end of the thing and tried to get other planets. It's interesting that the victory points don't get added up during the game at all. So you only get victory points for the state of the game at the very end. Yeah, I quite like that aspect. Yeah, so it does mean the last play. I can imagine it might, especially if you're going to play with five or six people, it might slow down a bit towards the end. But then again, you lose a bit of momentum because you've sent so many troops and spaceships down to the planets. You, your biggest moves are probably at the beginning of the round rather than at the end of the round. So, yeah, that was Onward to Venus. Really chuffed with that. £10. Well spent. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, we have a full mailbag. We have questions aplenty. Positively bulging adam cox asks do you think board games should be advertised for a lesser player count than they actually allow he just apologized for the wording and says uh, he bought subterra to be played as a two player because it's advertised as being playable for one to six but then realized when he bought it that if you play it two player you have to play two characters each effectively turn it into a four player game hmm um, depends. See, I, I don't mind that kind of situation so much because that's the sort of thing I'd do in, say, something like Mansions of Madness. You know, you could go around with, like, one character if you wanted to, but um, I generally just run around with three or four because it's a cooperative, so it doesn't really make any difference. But I can yeah. see his point because, I mean, for something like, say, I mean, to take it to the extreme, Twilight Imperium, you know, if you wanted to play, say, a four-player ga- a two-player game, you can, although it's ideally for a minimum of three, but you could play like as two players each, but the amount of stuff going on in your head for that would just be obscene. So mm. you would need four different players. I I wish it's something actually which is one of the brilliant pieces of information on Board Game Geek is you can vote on which number of players you think is best for the game. So which the game seems to be designed around. Okay, that's a good idea. And I think that should that would be really useful if that was on the box. Yes. Like for instance, I, I can see over my shoulder in the in the Skype video Endeavor. Endeavour can be played two-player, and there's rules in this new version that puts in like a dummy player to make it even more interesting, but I really think that's a four or five or even a six-player game. That's pretty much what you and I said when we played it, because we had to use the dummy player, and whilst it did work, um, I can see it being much better with at least four, because there's just more competition Mm. for spaces, and that's what made the game interesting. Yeah. Well, like we we were going to possibly talk about Chartstone today, but we decided we had enough to talk about Mm. One of my complaints of that game is we played it two-player and I really felt that was a six-player game. And having played it as a six-player game, it most certainly is. It is shit with two players. It doesn't work. Um, And I can actually, to be honest, it's not the the first Stonemaier game I can say it's guilty of because Euphoria is similar. Whilst you can play Euphoria with two players and it kind of works, it's more of a race than anything else because there Mm. isn't... when When you say build a market in Euphoria you usually get to the point where at least one player can't contribute to that market. Whereas in the two-player, you always can, which kind of defeats the, op- the, the, the the purpose of it. I was going to say, I think more often than not, there should be a minimum limit on these games. And if you're a decent board game designer, the limit should be set at what what starts it being a good game. Mm. If it's If it's yeah. you can play it with two... I think you should set it at three, personally. And I think... I think the reason they do it is because there'll be people there who won't buy a game 
Yeah, if they won't play a game if it's only available for solo, and if it plays best with three, but it can play with two, they'll go, well, I only play two-player games, so I'd want to buy it then. But I agree with you. It needs, I think it needs an extra piece of information that kind of says, yeah, you can play one play with this, but it's designed for four. Yeah, recommended for, but will go down to yeah. three or something. Yeah, something like that would be better, definitely. I mean, you could say the same about, I mean, we, we said the same about Castles of Mad King Ludwig between two castles. Whilst you can play it with three, it's shit. You need the gap for that game, don't you? Yes, you do. You need at least four. It's it's just a, it just doesn't really work. It's it's functional but not enjoyable. The other thing I'd say is there are a good number of games out there that have an upper limit st- stated on them, but actually play fine with one or two more players than the the maximum. You're going to say talisman, Mister Cage. I'm going to come around your house and beat you. <laughs> I wasn't going to say talisman actually, but you're right. Get, That's a good the, example. Get the car started. <laughs> I was going to say Dixit, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I can see Dixit. Yeah. yeah, because that game, that I can see that game working, regard the same really regardless of the number of players. Mm. Yeah. Code names mm. that works with a lot of people. In fact, I, the more people that play code names, I think the better that game is. Yeah. Fifteen aside, God, that'd be mad. I think there's a exactly good number of games <laughs> out there that they set the limit, the upper limit, much lower than it should be. Hmm. I'll agree with that. Mm. There are some games that, although it can be played that way, shouldn't. Like, for instance, you can play Eldritch Horror of eight people. I wouldn't recommend mm. it. Dream Wars you could was if the you same. had a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dream Wars was the same. Yeah. We played it with eight, and it, no. Just, just, just no. Best with four. Not unless you want to see daylight that week. Exactly. Oh, God. Andy McDonald asks, um, do you think the board game bubble is about to burst or do you think it will continue on its present course? Personally, I can't really keep up with the amount of board games being produced. Yeah, he's not the only one. That's a common no, complaint. I agree with that. Mm. I think there's a third option, which is that it's not going... I don't think it's going to keep on going on its present course, which is quite a steep one. Mm. I don't think it's going to pop like a bubble, but I can see a plateau coming. Yes. A readjustment, mm. as they would say in the housing market. Yeah. Yes, I think the. I mean, we've we've touched on this before a couple of times in different guises. I mean, the Kickstarter bubble. I think that will burst to a point, but I think John's probably closer with it'll plateau. I don't think the likes of Seamon mm. and possibly even Awakened Realms, depending on how they they do in the next one, will be able to maintain the momentum that they've got and the size of campaigns. Certainly for the... Simon have already basically shown now, haven't they? they you know, we mentioned in the news a few months back how Simon were not making as much money last year as they'd expected. Yeah. Because their Kickstarters weren't doing as good as they were in the past. Mm. Now, burst, I think burst is a strong word, but I think I think you're right. An, an adjustment is likely to happen, personally. Yes. I think we are starting to say it with us as a group, and I'm starting to hear murmurs of other people saying it. There's a point, like, for instance, I am stacked out now. I've got no room for any more games. And I'm also looking at the games I've got and thinking, you know, when a new game comes out, oh, do I want to buy that? I do want to buy it, but, like, that sounds very similar to a game I've already got, which I haven't played. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think there is a, as you said, a levelling off about to happen. And I'm, I, my, I think there's a reduction in the amount of... I don't know, that's not tangible. I would say I think there's a reduction in the amount of people backing big kickstarters but i don't think that's true actually i'm not basing that on anything i'm just basing that on what people around me do given that tainted grail recently funded as the biggest kickstarter ever yeah exactly Mm. (laughs) something like four million quid they raised for that that board game i don't think you can say that (laughs) no no i can't i think I think it's wrong, yeah. But what the there is a problem in that there are too many games, mm. and it's not and it's not just us saying, "Oh no, there's too many games to play." We're spoiled for choice. There is an actual serious problem in that the retailers are struggling with so many games being released. I mean, you look at the the, the information I get about what games are released. Uh, Board Game Guru, which is a, a, an online store, send out an email every week. Uh, this is like this is our new stock. This is our restock. And that list is like, that new stock is like 40 items. That includes everything. So it often includes like RPGs and card games and things like that. Mm. But you're looking at thinking that's a hell of a lot of things. Yeah. So something's got to give at some point. I think, you know, there's 
you can't go into a board game shop and see every single board game that's available to buy at the moment. True. Yeah. And then the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like Wingspan that came out, and Jamie Stegmaier has basically said he completely underestimated demand for that game and can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, it does seem popular. I don't know. It's it's. I wonder if there's an element. I mean, I think we've we've said this before as well. Is that we are getting to the point, and I don't think we're the only group who suffers this. Is that we are getting to the point now where we can afford to be choosy. Yes. Where you know, I think there are a lot of good things out there, and the, the stuff that we do want to buy, as you say. But there's also a lot of dross, and there always will be, I'm sure. But we are now get. We have got to the point now where we can, as you say, we're limited for space, we're limited for time, we're limited for. Less limited for money, but it's a, you know what I mean. It's not the sort. I mean, we can we can yeah. afford to drop thirty quid on a punt. The bottleneck is our time and our physical space to store the the damn thing. Precisely, <laughs> exactly, yes. And of course, now we we have to get choosy. We have to get picky. And it's like, do you know what? I don't fancy that. As you say, Steve, there's a lot of similarity with uh, with with certain games we've got. We've just said it today on this very podcast. We've all looked at hyperspace. We've all looked said and gay. Oh, that looks amazing. Mm. And then both me and you, Andy, have gone, it's exactly the same. It looks too similar to games I already own, which I don't play enough of as it yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm already looking at my my collection now and thinking, yeah, there's a few things I actually should probably sell because I just don't play them. Not because I don't want to, it's just there are other games there that I play more and want to play more. So there's no point in taking up the space, he says, having just bought a new Kallax. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's another problem as well. If board games keep coming out at the rate they're coming out, my poor little news ferrets, they're going to be exhausted. <laughs> going to have to buy some more in or something. <laughs> Outsource. It's, it's weird, actually. What I notice it more with is miniatures games. Mm-hmm. I, was, I had an email this week, just a double blog standard like news shot from the people who make the Bushido miniature game, and I can't, I, I, I've forgotten I'd even subscribed to this bloody email. And it came through, and I went, wow, okay, they're still going, they're still making miniatures for this game. And then I realised there was another email from Privateer Press with their more War Machine miniatures, and it's like, okay, I know I don't play any miniatures games anymore, but I, I just... I couldn't fathom starting collecting a new game at the moment. We mentioned last year how we were really interested in playing Star Wars Legion, mm-hmm. and I've not picked it up because it's like for exactly the same reasons we're looking at board games. Don't have the time to learn new rules, don't have the time to play it with all the other games we've got, mm. and don't have the space. That's it. Speaking of playing games that we already own, mm. Andy Grant asks us, what board games from 2010 or before do you or would you still play? John Cage, your first answer is known, so it doesn't count. Uh. (laughs) Apparently D&D is also exempt for everybody again because we know it already. Yeah. And that's quite a good question. So I looked through this. I saw this question and went into Board Game Geek and looked at what games were released before 2010. And it's it's all the kind of classics, I think. Mm. Pluto, Monopoly, Game of Life, <laughs> Escape from Atlantis. Actually, I still would play Escape, I still Escape from Atlantis if I could find it. The really nasty horse racing game. Yeah, classics. <laughs> um, I have Mahjong, actually. That was bought in, I think, 1978 by my mother, which I now have. But it was obviously a, a game mm-hmm. that is centuries old. So I was looking at this list of games that... Um, I would currently keep a stain in my collection, so things like Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. Check. I know technically it should have been replaced by both Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, but God damn it, that game is staying in my collection. <laughs> Dominion. I love Dominion. I know a lot of people say it's themeless and boring, but I absolutely love mm-hmm. it. Carcassonne. Carcassonne. Yeah, Carcassonne. Uh, Ticket to Ride, because I can never get rid of that, because my wife would kill me if I tried to. Check. Brass. Brass. <laughs> Because Brass Lancashire came out before 2010. Have you got Brass? The original version. Brass. No, I haven't, but it's a game I'd like to... I, I would play. Ah. That's what I'm saying. It, it, it's, it's a really good game. Okay, it's not the... It, I would play your version, which is the 2018 version, mm. But so maybe that's a bit of a cheat. Pandemic. Check. That's pre-2010. Yeah, is it? Bloody hell. Battlestar, yeah. Battlestar Galactica. Check. Yeah. Got that. Hmm. Galaxy Trucker. Check. Small World. I haven't played that for a very mm. long time. So I still like that game, but I need to play. I haven't played that. I must admit, I've not played that a long time. That's one of those. You know, when you said earlier about games when some people you don't 
people you introduce games to who don't know games. Mm-hmm. Small World is one of those games. Yeah. You've heard of Risk? Here's a much simpler, much more fun version of Risk. I quite like Risk. Oh, dear. <laughs> Have we got one for Andy? Have we got a cold, crappy game that Andy likes? Ha-ha. <laughs> 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 I've always, I've not played it in Donkey's Years. I actually do own a copy of it, which I've never played my copy of. I had it when it was, like, in the 80s, say, like, proper old school, maybe 90s, Risk, because they've changed it since, and I'm not quite sure I like the look of the, the, the modern versions because I think they've tried to streamline it. Isn't that a good thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want the full four-hour experience of watching Steve. my opponent falling asleep, trying to work out if I'm ever going to bother invading the Urals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what about you two? What are you, you guys, then? Well, most of that list, and you mentioned you've got Nirishima Hex on the end of there as well. Ah, yes. Uh, I would count that in my list. Mm-hmm. See, the only problem with Nirishima Hex is now it's kind of been replaced by Monolith Arena. Mm. Yeah, I think quite a lot of my board game collection, actually, I haven't looked at the dates, but I would guess things like uh, Robo Rally. Yeah. What other ones do I play regularly? How old's Quirkle? Ooh, I've got Android. That's 2008. The original? It is. Oh, God. Yeah. Have you played that yes. yet? Yes. <laughs> I quite like it, actually. Um, it's, it's good game. It is a it's good just game. Very bizarre. Yes, it's not what I expected, but it is very good. We all enjoyed it. It takes bloody ages, though. My God. Oh yeah, that's that's a whole afternoon game. Yeah, that yeah, is. it is. Well, it takes you an hour just to explain the rules. Yes, that is accurate. Actually, yes, it took main course and pudding to explain even half <laughs> of that game. <laughs> I love that. That's how you measure it. <laughs> Uh, Quirkle was 2006, John. So, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blockus, Genius, yeah. all those or, kind of. Or Blue Chess. Have you prefer? Not played chess for ages, but I used to play it quite a lot. Mm, I used to have a drinking too. chess set. Awesome. <laughs> also, Othello. Did. I really like Othello. <laughs> now I get confused between Othello and Go. Othello. Is Othello the ones you flip tokens? Yes. Oh, I love that. Oh, yes, I quite mm. like I really like Go. I've got a copy of that as it happens. Really? So did you know there were two games called Go? There's did the Chinese one. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and there's also a game called Go that I had in my childhood, which is basically you're flying around the world. So, so there's like a rondelle around the outside of the board, and there's a map of the world on the, in, on the, on the middle bit, and there's like um, um, air connections between various major cities around the world, and you sort of score points and stuff by travelling... The, to these destinations and you kind of got to go around the board and get money and make a business trip and all this sort of stuff I mean it's essentially roll and move but there's a bit more to it and that was quite good fun as a kid but I've never been able to see it so I've never seen it since Jenga our outdoor Jenga gets aired pretty much every summer it's always good fun for barbecues so a couple of the last questions to round us off Torin Spence asks which app versions have made the physical board game redundant <sighs> Do you even do you two even play board games on apps, no. tablets, computers? The only one I've played excessively is Nirishima Hex. Okay, but but has it replaced the board game? Absolutely not. I would play the the app version on my own, but the joy of board games for me is playing it with other people. Mm. You know, so you mm. can look them in the eyes while you're dicking them over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play apps, so no, they they do not. I tend to play them on the train into work. Um, I would say that the only one, the ones that stick in my mind are Ascension. I have no intention of playing Ascension in real life after playing the app version. Mm. The app version is quite fun. The I can't I can imagine just the board game being faffy. Uh, the other one, which I'm a little bit disappointed by because I've actually got a copy of it, is the Pathfinder card game. Mm-hmm. Because I've got the I got the full first set of that on iPad, and I've got the Wrath of the Righteous on in, in physical version, and I really like playing that. I, I I'm crap at it, <laughs> but I really like playing that on the iPad because it takes about thirty five minutes, which means by the time I've got myself seated in play, it means I can finish a game, look up and go, ah, one more station to go. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Eclipse, which can take an hour to play, I look up and go, shit, that's my stop, that's my stop, that's my stop. <laughs> oh my God, I'm in Scotland. 
<laughs> Why am I in Bogner? Hmm. I think that has successfully lessened the load of the mailbag for this week. Mm-hmm. And we've kept you very good people at home listening for far too long. Unless they've already turned off. <laughs> well, they won't hear this then, they won't. Wait, no. <laughs> if you have made it this far, thank you very much for listening. We have been Polyhedron Collider. If you enjoyed this, please give us a re- review on iTunes, or I think you can bleed, leave the review on Stitcher as well. There are no reviews on Stitcher at the moment. You could be the first. There may be a prize. There, there won't be not. a prize. <laughs> uh, you can chat to us on Twitter. We are collectively at Polyhedron C. I am at Wahothel Medenga. I am at Sonic H with a zero. I'm at John underscore Cage. We are also on Facebook and on the Board Game Geek Guild 2726. And if you enjoy a bit of D&D, we're live on twitch.tv forward slash Polyhedron Collider every Thursday. Every, well, every other Thursday is the Champions of Chance and the following Thursday, every other Thursday, is the Masters of Fate. So Andy's on one, I'm on the other and Steve is DM masterfully for both. You can also find those sessions a day or two later when I pull my finger out on youtube.com forward slash user forward slash polyhedron collider. And you can, of course, find the podcast there as well. Indeed. So for now, happy gaming. Goodbye. Catch you later. Bye.